Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, last week, we're still in the same chapter, John, John 14. We're in the upper room with the disciples, and Jesus has just broken the news that he's going somewhere that they can't follow. And the disciples are afraid. All of a sudden, the future is unknown. The plans that they had laid, the things they thought they could count on and expect, seem to be vanishing in a puff. But we learn that Jesus recognizes this, and he's assuring his disciples that they're going to be okay, that he has plans, and this is part of those plans, even if at the time the disciples can't really see it, even when they can't understand it. That sounds familiar, I'm sure. We've all had times in our lives, and maybe you're in the midst of one of those right now, where you had plans for the future, and you thought you knew how things were going to go, and then something happens, something that reveals to you how little control you have over the future, something that changes your plans. The disciples find themselves in this situation still this week, and Jesus is still continuing in his mercy and grace to assure them that they're not alone, that they don't have any reason to be afraid, even though they can't control the future, because... He can, and he's come to change it for our good. He starts by saying here, He, the Father, will give you another helper. What words of comfort this would be, because the disciples are thinking that Jesus is abandoning them. They're going to be alone. Have you ever felt that before? Felt abandoned? And maybe it happened to you suddenly, and how scary that can be that all of a sudden you're on your own. Maybe it's when your parents dropped you off at college, and as much as you wanted to get out of the house and get out from underneath their thumb, everything's packed in your room, and they're in the car driving away, and then all of a sudden it hits you. I'm on my own. It's a little scary, even when it's intended. It's even more scary when it's unexpected when it's not planned. So we can certainly resonate with the assuring words of our Lord Jesus in the gospel today that God is going to send you another helper. I'm not abandoning you, he says to his disciples, and you are not alone. Even though I'm going somewhere where you cannot follow, my presence will still be here with you, and God is sending you someone who can help. So who is this helper? As you may have noticed in the text, the word helper in verse 16 is capitalized. So it's not just a generic word referring to somebody who helps you out, but a specific and important figure, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the gift from God and the part of the Trinity that we probably, if we admit it to ourselves as Lutherans especially, makes us the most uncomfortable because we're not sure what to do with the Holy Spirit. We can't grab onto it, quantify it. He doesn't inform us of his plans, which would be really nice if he did. So how is he going to help us out? Well, as I mentioned to the kids... God sends us many helpers. We're celebrating some of those today in our mothers. But they're one among many of the blessings that God puts in our lives of people who help us out. This is the core of the blessing of the gathering of the faithful. The reason why today, being in the presence of God, gathered together, and his presence announces to us this assurance, the Holy Spirit is what connects us. Part of the gift of the church is this unity in spirit. You are not alone. But not only is this Holy Spirit the primary helper that is given to us, as Jesus is promising here, and which we'll celebrate in a few weeks as we celebrate Pentecost, but he's also the source of the joy of all the other helpers. Without the Holy Spirit our lives would be meaningless toil. 
Motherhood would just be another task to do. Fatherhood, likewise, being a good friend, just something you, you feel to, like you should do, but there's no higher meaning attached to those things until the Holy Spirit comes into play. And then everything gets transformed into a calling from God. And all of a sudden, the things that previously had no meaning are enriched with eternal meaning. Transformed from a meaningless task into a noble task with eternal consequences. And how is this possible? Because now the Holy Spirit is in you and is working through you to the glory of God and the accomplishing of His work. Because of the Holy Spirit, we are transformed from sinners dead in our sins to redeemed, living children of God. So in our gospel reading, Jesus is assuring his disciples with the presence of this helper. He says, I'm going to ask the Father and he's going to send a helper when I go to prepare a place for you and where you cannot yet follow me. But what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, in catechism class, when I was in junior high, this was the definition I was taught. And as I've thought about it, as I've grown older, it's a simple definition, but it's profound and true. The Holy Spirit's job is to give us the Jesus stuff. Why don't you say that with me? The Holy Spirit's job is to give us the Jesus stuff. Remember that. Remember that, because often we think we bring that stuff to ourselves, or we search it out and find it, or in some way earn it, but that isn't the case. The Holy Spirit, directed by the request from Jesus to the Father, brings us all the things of Jesus, all the things He promises. After all, Jesus came to reveal the truth, and he says here in our gospel reading that this helper, the Holy Spirit, is even the spirit of truth. By this Holy Spirit, it's the only way we can receive God's word and the truth that Jesus brings and have faith in his promises. As Lutherans, this is the core of our faith. This was the great realization of Luther in the Reformation, that it wasn't us earning God's favor and thus receiving his promises but it was a Holy Spirit coming to us freely as a gift of grace from Jesus so that we may believe. So now you know the answer the next time someone says, well, why do you believe in Jesus? Because the Holy Spirit has given me faith to do so. And it may turn out like Jesus describes here, right? He says the world cannot receive this Spirit because they don't recognize it. They don't see him or know him, but you do, because Jesus has come to you and in his grace given you this spirit. Now, just a few verses later in the same chapter, Jesus says this of the Holy Spirit, this helper, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. I can't remember when exactly I was reading that, but it really struck me because it reinforced the idea of how I can have faith in the Scriptures. Because the Holy Spirit, the helper sent from Jesus so that his disciples were taught all the things of Jesus and the Holy Spirit brought to them the remembrance of all of those things. So they were able to write them down and pass them on. And through the Holy Spirit, the church exists to this day, continually preaching, sharing, and hearing this word and receiving the Spirit. After all, this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 10 when he talks about faith. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. How are they going to hear if nobody's sent? And how are they going to be sent if no one teaches? And how are they going to know what to say? unless it's first given them by God. And so here in this chapter, this gospel reading we have today, 
This is what Jesus says. This is what he means when he says, For you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Right now, as he's speaking to his disciples in John 14 in the upper room, they have not yet received the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is there because Jesus is there. And he brings the spirit of truth with him wherever he goes. And soon he's assuring them with the words of the promise that he's going to give this gift to them. And no longer will the Holy Spirit simply be with you, but he will be in you. Creating new life in you. As we celebrated last week with Henry's baptism. He received the Holy Spirit which transforms his old dead life into a new, vibrant, eternal life, assuring him of the promises of Jesus, which now, having received the Spirit, he can see and know and believe. This is such a crucial and core component of our faith in God. It's why we baptize babies, because... They can't make those statements themselves. They can't grasp them intellectually because faith isn't an intellectual endeavor but a gift from God given by the Holy Spirit. But then we get to a tricky part of the text. where He says that the world cannot receive this gift because they don't recognize it. They don't see it. They don't know it. And each one of us has somebody in our life Maybe it's a family member or a friend or a child or a parent or a sibling who doesn't believe. And often it irks us. We wonder why. If faith is a gift, why, haven't, why hasn't this person received the same spirit that I've been given? So how exactly does one receive this helper? Well, Jesus goes on to say, You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So as I mentioned before, the spirit of truth is with Jesus wherever he goes. And today, in 2023 and throughout the history of the church, where is Jesus? He's in his word and in his sacraments, continually and generously and lovingly being given out to his church. The same spirit given by Jesus to his disciples on Pentecost. They know the helper because they know Jesus. And more, or rather, more importantly, they, that Jesus knows them and has revealed himself to them. It's the same for us today. We know the Holy Spirit because Jesus has revealed himself to us. He's revealed himself to us in his word. A word that was first given to you by a parent, perhaps, or maybe by a friend, or maybe you wandered into a church one day and you heard a sermon and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit was there. A miracle of divine love. And now everything changes for the truth You can see it, and you can hear it, and you can believe it. Now you're one of those weirdos who thinks that when somebody says a word and dumps some water on somebody's head, they have a new eternal life in Christ. Now you're one of those weirdos who believes that when you gather around the altar and you eat that little wafer, which maybe sometimes doesn't taste very good, or the wine that's, "Ah, you know, if it was my choice, I wouldn't drink it, is actually the body and blood of the eternal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in doing so, you receive him into your body and his righteousness, the forgiveness of sins, so that when God the Father looks at you, he sees a perfect child. You aren't alone. We aren't alone. Our Lord Jesus hasn't abandoned us. Because just like the disciples, there are times in our lives, and maybe you're in the middle of one right now, Or it feels like God has done exactly that. That you can't feel his presence. You can't see what he's doing or understand where he's leading you. And you feel discouraged and dismayed. So here are the words of assurance from our Lord Jesus today. 
They bring assurance to his disciples all those years ago, and they do to you today as well. You aren't alone. While Jesus is preparing a place for you in heaven, he has asked the Father to send a helper, and he has done so. You have received the Holy Spirit. You know him because you know Jesus, because Jesus has revealed himself to you. We, like the disciples, need this assurance. And so we come to church where Jesus has promised to meet us and to give us the things of heaven, the gifts of his divine love received by faith born from this spirit, which we can now see and know and believe. And then we can take real comfort in the words in verse 19, because I live, you also will live. Because the ultimate change to our plans in this life is death. Seems inconquerable. It is obviously outside our control. And it's ruthless in informing us of that. But because I live, you also will live. Know that. Hear it. And believe it by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, which he has given to each and every one of you. The resurrection proves it, a miracle of love that can only be seen and believed by God's grace in the giving of this spirit. Otherwise, it seems sheer nonsense. But in the spirit of truth given to each of you, it is the salvation of all people unto eternal life. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, We give you thanks for honoring the request of Jesus in sending the Helper, a Holy Spirit that by which we can see and hear and know the truth, the truth that God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to do what we could not, to live the perfect life and then take all of our sin into himself and die on the cross and in return give us his perfect righteousness. Help us to be humble in our faith, knowing that it is a gift from you, and rest secure in it, knowing that it can never falter because it comes from you. And assure us by that Holy Spirit in the times when we don't know what's going on and we don't understand your plans and our future changes. Help us to know that it doesn't really change, not the ultimate future, because in you we have a sure and certain hope of eternal life. In the name of Jesus, amen.